I think we're finally live. Hey, 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 it's Tony Ortega. I'm here with Megan Kunif. How are you, Megan? I'm well. How are you? Wow, I tell you what, it's been it's been quite uh, a day. I mean, uh, I mean, I knew I knew yesterday was going to be kind of difficult for me because I couldn't be there. You know, I, I was, you know, yeah. Um, I got to know you because we we were both at we were at both trials, and I, my little particular niche was just trying to type up everything happening and put it out as fast as possible. Exactly. But then you would then put together an actual story about what happened. And I have to tell you, I was so impressed time after time how well you, you know, mastered all that information and put together these comprehensive uh, overviews of this case. So uh, that's how I got to know you. And, and uh, I was just really jealous that you got to be there yesterday. And I'd love to hear uh, your impressions of how it went down. Yeah, well, number one, it was not the same without you. And I felt terrible that <laughs> you couldn't be there. But I definitely felt like you were there in spirit. And um, I mean, the the row where you usually are, we claimed that pretty fast. And uh, we didn't we didn't want to get out of there. So we we had a good presence in the courtroom. And I mean, like you said, it was such a day. It was such a big moment for everybody like you who's been following this case since day one, the victims, but then also Danny Masterson's family and his supporters. I mean, I think one thing that really stood out to me about yesterday was how divided the courtroom seemed. On the one hand, there were people there. It was very emotional. This was a really day of finality for them, but it kind of depended on where you were sitting in the courtroom. And I felt like just where I was seated, the people that I saw the most was Danny Masterson's family. And then I think a couple of people seated ne near me in the gallery were also on Danny's side of it. So it's, it's just kind of depends on where you were in the courtroom, like what kind of vibe you were getting. And because of that, it's kind of hard to just describe the atmosphere in the courtroom other than just saying it was such a mix, but there was overall so much relief for the victims. And especially when they spoke, it was hard for anyone not to be totally captivated by that. Well, speaking about the Master family, um, one thing I remember from May 31st was that once we realized, once the clerk had told us that something was going on after lunch, that hallway was packed. And I think you were standing there by me, but, but what struck me was Danny was only three or four feet away from me and Bijou and the other family members. And mm -hmm. Megan, they seemed buoyant. I think they thought they were going to go in and hear that it was a hung jury. I really don't think they saw it coming. So that when we did go in the courtroom, it was such a shock that he was convicted. And, you know, uh, Bijou let out that wail. And the reason I bring that up was I felt like today could not have been that kind of surprise for them. They knew that Judge Almeida was only choosing between 15 to life to, or 30 to life. It wasn't like they were hoping she'd say six months in jail and weekends at home <laughs> or something. And that they they're just at this point thinking, well, it doesn't matter what she says. We're going to we're going to do the appeal and we're going to win an appeal. So I just figured maybe they'd be um, sad, obviously, but not so shocked and surprised. Right. Exactly. I think that was a good description of it. Uh, Bijou, especially when I, I saw her in the hallway before the proceeding started, she was wearing sunglasses and, and she was standing kind of in the middle of the hallway, just kind of frozen. She wasn't usually in, during the trial. She'd be chatting with people. She might say hi to me, but she seemed very just focused and, and really grieving at the moment. And then when it started and they brought him in and he, he wasn't in jail guard, but he was wearing his suit, but she started crying and was very emotional to see him in custody like that. So I, I was kind of wondering, oh, you know, oh no, if this the hearing hasn't even proceeded, started yet, and how is this going to go? But she actually did maintain her composure pretty well as it went on. And I think, like you said, it's because this really wasn't a surprise. And I think Sean Hawley and Phil Cohen, even though they, they made an argument for 15 years and they, and it was definitely possible, they had to have warned 
Danny, that just given Judge Olmedo's posture over the case and, and some of the stances that she's taken, it was unlikely he was going to get 15 years. So, I, yeah, like you said, 30 years the, and, and the 15 years per charge had just been kind of hanging over the courtroom in the gallery the whole trial. I mean, it seems like everybody knew that. It was 45 years was the number that was kind of being passed around during the trials just because of the three charges. Right. But the 30 years when we had the two two convictions, I it seemed non-negotiable. So there was the 15 year possibility, but yeah, this couldn't have been a surprise for the Masterson family for sure. So Danny's been in custody for three months now. Um, there were no cameras in the courtroom. However, Mona, our yes. friend, the sketch artist that we love so much, she was there. And I have to say, just based on her drawings, not having been there, uh, yeah, they let Danny change into a suit once he came to the courthouse. That's pretty much standing standard operating procedure. But in her drawing, not only did he have a beard this time, he looked thinner, yes, a little more gaunt, a little older. Did, did yes. you get that sense? Definitely. I think he 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 looks almost like a, a shell of a, his former self, just very skinny, and the suit just kind of hanging on him. But uh, the thick beard, which I, I I think is standard Danny Masterson, it seems like the uh, non beard was really exceptional and for the jury trial. But uh, thick beard, and then kind of that same kind of sunken into his chair per slips. I mean, and to, to say he's non-reactive is inaccurate, but it's also not accurate to say that he's overly emotional in these proceedings too. But he definitely seemed like somebody who's been in jail for the last right. three months, four months. Reading uh, the notes I got on the three Jane Doe victim statements, I have to say I was utterly impressed. I, I just thought, you know, this is an opportunity that's going to be, this is going to, a situation that's going to be emotional. Maybe they'll get a little sidetracked, maybe, you know, but no, they were laser focused. I mean, just based on the notes, you tell me, it just felt like they were very, very well focused. Jane Doe 1 in particular really hammered Scientology. All three of them did, but especially Jane Doe 1. And uh, I don't know, I just thought they did a beautiful job making the, uh, the room understand how much a price they've been paying for what Danny did to them. Definitely. There was a, a, a real focus on just the long lasting effects of this. And it was kind of fitting with the, the theme of the case, the 20 year gap between the crimes and then the convictions. And they were able to, I think, fill that gap with their victim impact statements, just talking about everything they've been through the last few years. So I, yeah, I think that was a very, very powerful moment there. One thing that was surprising and maybe not surprising, but I just wasn't sure what to expect was just the length of some of the statements. I mean, sometimes you'll get people who are not able to talk for more than a minute or so, but it was uh, remarkable. The, the 10 to 15 to maybe even 20 minutes that we were hearing these statements, they were really able to, to hold it together long enough to do that and, and really be able to say a lot. So me taking notes, um, you know, the stuff I shared in the article was, I thought the most pertinent stuff about Scientology, the crimes, the effects of it, but you know, there was other stuff too. And I'm, I'm hoping that the uh, victim's lawyer will have a copy or something that she wants that she's able to distribute us so we could get their entire words. Cause I think that would be really powerful for everyone to read it at, at once. I'm not, it's just a privacy thing for the victims, but it is something that we could get from the court reporter if we wanted to buy the transcript. I hope they, I hope they do because uh, you know, what I put up were notes from someone that was in the courtroom and obviously they're doing the best they can, but uh, you know, knowing the Jane Doe's, they want the most accurate version of what they said and they could make that real easy on us by just making sure we got copies I would be happy, and I know you would be, to post that immediately if we could just get copies of the statements they read from. And let me just let me just double check minor point I know, but based on what I read, uh, Jane Doe one and two gave their own statements, but but Jane Doe three statement was read by uh, Ariel Anson. That's right. That's right. Jane Doe uh, three statement was the first statement that was read. And at first, I mean, the courtroom was just so packed and it's kind of hard to see everything. At first, I thought that it was because Jane Doe three wasn't there in court, but she, she was. She just had the, the prosecutor read it. So uh, that set off the day and it was uh, a, a shorter than the others, but also powerful in what she went into and just how she addressed the long lasting effects of this. And and one thing as, you know, kind of a legal nerd, I thought, 
thought was interesting was in the very beginning, she thanked Judge Olmedo for giving her the chance to speak. Because as uh, probably your viewers know, the jury actually split eight to four in favor of guilty, but did not convict on the charge involving Jane Doe 3. So prosecutors have said that they're not going to pursue that charge again. But the two convictions were for Jane Doe 1 and 2. But actually, as you reported back in August, prosecutors made the request that Jane Doe 3 also be allowed to give a statement. And Judge Almito allowed that, which is contrary to what happened in the Harvey Weinstein case. Actually, Gloria Allride made the same request on behalf of some of the victims who Weinstein wasn't convicted of. And uh, Judge Lynch, who's just down the hallway from Judge Almito, said no. And uh, Gloria actually tried it with the appellate court and they ignored her until after sentencing. So uh, in Weinstein's case, the judge only heard from the Jane Doe one who he was convicted of uh, raping when there were four other Jane Doe's uh, charged as victims. But then Olmito down the hallway allowed uh, Jane Doe three to speak. And she thanked the judge in the beginning of the statement and said that she really hopes it helps uh, she and her family and uh, her, she and her husband were there. And she's talked before about her children. I remember one, one, one thing that stands out to me from her testimony. I think it was the second trial where, where she testified. And I, I think she said something like, I just, I just want to be home with my babies, you know? And that's one thing that always kind of stands out to me from her, from her testimony. It wasn't like an answer to any question. It was just kind of like after she'd answered the question, she just kind of, kind of said that out loud. And it was just, you know, how personal it is and right. what a big thing it is for her. And uh, she also talked about having a hard time leaving the house. Uh, I yes. think she did a very good job describing how these incidents years later are still having a big effect on her life. Yeah. Yeah, she did. She talked about just the self-esteem issues and, and, and everything that came with it, how she believed everything that Danny said and, and the problems that led that has led in future relationships and just what she's doing now. But she did, thank her husband and say that, you know, she can't, can't believe that she's married to such an amazing man. But what, what she said was really echoed in the other statements too. I mean, uh, Jane Doe one and Jane Doe two both really talked about how this has affected their lives and how this is really carried on with them. And we heard that from Reinhold uh, Mueller when he talked to both in court and, and outside court. So that was really kind of the lasting, lasting theme of the comments for sure. Yeah, Jane Doe, too, I mean, you can see she's a writer. She had some really interesting observations about what this has done to her life and how she's tried to move on. And didn't she have kind of a remarkable finish to her statement saying that she forgives? Danny, can you help us understand what she said at that moment? She she did. She, she was really... Uh she was really letting him have it for a little bit saying that, you know, his, his number one pleasure is hurting women. But then she, she gave him some suggestions for things to do in prison. She said, listen to the, you know, the brilliance of, of nothing to read books and try to reflect on himself on, on himself. And then she said, I, I forgive you. And I, I, I don't know want, want to say I was surprised to hear that, but because I just don't know what to expect because this is such a personal experience for them. Like nobody else can, can interpret or say this is how I what I would do, but I guess it was just, um, just unexpected, you know, and just and just kind of a, a a nice finish to the whole thing for her. Wow, wow. Yeah. And um, now, the defense, of course, as they're paid to do, tried to raise some things. One of which was, like you said, they tried to convince Judge Olmedo to have the two counts run concurrently. So it's 15 to life. Uh, and also um, one of their newer attorneys I wasn't real familiar with was making an argument from case law and yeah. trying to convince Judge Olmedo that she was wrong about some things. How did that play out? Yeah, that was a uh, uh, Ben Coleman. He's an appellate attorney down in uh, San Diego, and he's experienced. and And it goes to what Sean Hawley said afterward about them, you know, really pursuing the appeal. And what I've talked about on on other shows about how I mean, the Church of Scientology is pretty stacked legally. 
they've got tons of resources and they don't mess around with lawyers, just the lawyers that they hire. I mean, the fact that judges, L.A. Superior Court judges, a few of them, when they're assigned cases involving Scientology, have to recuse themselves because like their right. spouse used to work for Scientology. You know, right. it's like they're, they're very, uh, very stacked legally. And I think Ben Coleman is an example of the resources that they're going to be putting toward the appeal. But he was arguing and this is argued in their motion for new trial, which I'm looking forward to reading. But it was about the statute of limitations regarding the two rape convictions, because, of course, there's some interesting issues regarding the 20 year gap and the need for the multiple convictions to to have the statute of limitations not apply here. So he was arguing that there's some new cases that came around after some previous judges, because uh, while well, Judge Almedo has been on the case for a long time, in the very beginning, there were there was another judge who made some pretty key rulings regarding the statute of limitations that essentially the motion was asking Judge Almedo to overrule, say that there's new case law that shows that those decisions were wrong. And she was citing the LA Superior Court rules that say she can't do that. And as prosecutor said, it was basically asking Judge Almedo to act as a one person appellate court when mm-hmm. there's a whole separate appellate court for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And just real quick to go over that again, because I had to sit through those hearings two years ago <laughs> is that, uh, yeah. These incidents occurred a long time ago in 2001 and 2003, and no, you could not, the prosecutors could not bring any of those cases individually to court today. They are too old. However, there is a strict law in California called the One Strike Law, and one of its provisions is that forcible rape, if there are multiple counts, then carry penalties of 15 to life each. And as as, uh, Prosecutor Reinhold Mueller explained in court, once there is a potential life sentence, there is no statute of limitations. But the trick is, it's multiple. You have to have at least two convictions to qualify. So they filed three, knowing that they needed two. And that's what they ended up with. We got count one and count two were guilty. The jury was hung up on uh, on count three, but they got the two they needed. That's 15 to life each. And according to that law, they're supposed to run consecutively. It's a harsh, harsh law. So that means Danny's got to go 30 to life, which means he's not even eligible for parole until he's 77 years old. So that's that's why, you know, if I made this point in my video yesterday, if the Church of Scientology had not victimized these victims and had not protected Danny Masson and he had faced these charges in like 2005, he would have maybe gotten five years and he would have been out a long time ago. But because that it was charged under this one strike law, it's so much harsher. And really, Judge Almeida only had one choice to make yesterday, 15 to life or 30 to life. And as you're saying, those of us who knew her and knew the case, it was not a surprise that she went for the 30 to life. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say I was surprised just as somebody who's covered a lot of sentencing recently and has been unfortunately gotten kind of used to milk toast judges and judges not really dressing down defendants the way that they should be. I, I was surprised when she when she commented to that just because, I mean, while like you said, it's it's very fitting for Judge Almedo. It's not so fitting for the judges that I've seen recently. So to have her really come out against Masterson at the very end, I think was a pretty and, powerful. And, and tell us tell us what you saw her say. And, and she she said before she pronounced her sentence, she had a few things to say to Masterson, and she basically told him he was guilty. That uh, she's heard his defense and his complaints, and that she knows he sits there thinking, how can he be convicted for a sexual instance that happened 20 years ago when it's you know he said she said, and this woman has a vendetta against him. But she made it clear that that's not why he's here. That there's it's not a he said she said thing. That he's here because of his criminal actions and she pointed out the fact that the women all the victims had reported what he did soon after it happened to someone and there was corroborating evidence like that and and what i thought was was powerful and just and just a good reminder for me as a reporter when i'm going over the facts of the case she mentioned the non-disclosure agreement with uh i guess 
think it's Jane Doe one yeah. and the almost million dollar payment that Masterson made. What was that back in 2004? Cause Jane, Jane Doe one was the one who went to the police back in 2004. Right. right. And she, Jane Doe one went to the police in June, in June, 2004, the uh, LAPD was overwhelmed with affidavits from Scientology killing the investigation. At that point, Danny's um, entertainment attorney, uh, Marty Singer, and Scientology's master at arms, Julian Schwartz, and Scientology's attorney, in-house work attorney, Kendrick Moxon, all went to her and said, look, you got one choice. You're going to sign this document and take some money from Danny, or you're going to be de declared and you lose your family, your livelihood, mm -hmm. everything. I mean, that's how she testified. She really had no choice. And so she signed this document. It was for $400,000, which today I'm sure is worth more than a million. And, um, uh, you know, Danny paid that under a, 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 a pseudonym. Didn't use the name Danny Masson. I'm, I'm blanking yeah. on the name he, he used. But anyway, and uh, that's, you know, we heard some testimony about that. I was really looking forward to Marty Singer having to testify about that, yeah. but he got out of that. But it just shows you how much Scientology was really in control, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jane Doe one mentioned that in her statement and talked about she, she I'm, I'm blanking on the name too, but she did mention the suedo name and then brought up the fact that that non-disclosure agreement actually names her daughter. Her daughter was nine years old at the time and her daughter has her full name in the non-disclosure agreement. And yeah, David, David Duncan, somebody David just Duncan, Jacob Harkey, who, hi, by the way, Jacob, <laughs> I, I, I know you, but uh, some Orange County people here, but Thank uh, you, yeah. And then Judge Olmedo had brought up the fact that the million dollar payment is not something that, that she said, that's a lot of money to pay for uh, pay to a woman for in, something that didn't happen. I mean, and, right. and the way she said it, too, was just pretty sharply worded. And and I think, as, as, of course, as you saw, especially more of the second trial than I did, I mean, Judge Olmedo has made it pretty clear she was no fan of, especially Phil Cohen. She was dressing down Phil Cohen all the time. And gosh, she interrupted his uh, opening statement and sent the jury out of the courtroom to scold him. But you know what? As somebody who sees a lot of trials, she was pretty right on. And somebody once told me when I started covering superior court trials, because I, I cover a lot of federal court trials, they said, you know, deputy DAs hate judges who used to be federal prosecutors because those are the judges that, you know, make them follow the law and stuff. And Judge Almito is a former federal prosecutor. So it's just a different upbringing that she had. And it's just kind of a little more strict or formal background. But for her to really come out against them and, you know, just the fact that she's a, a, a female judge in doing complex criminal cases in L.A. Superior Court. I mean, she's been through a lot and seen a lot. So I think her, her comments were powerful there well i i pointed that out on may 31st i was struck by the fact that you had this woman judge who was so strong on the law and, and spent so much time trying to understand scientology you had this woman prosecutor who may have been the shortest person in the entire room who was <laughs> knocking us out with her closing statement ariel anson and then once the verdict was read, it was a woman deputy who walked over and put handcuffs on Danny Masterson. So I just thought that that was really a great uh, application of justice in this case, that women were involved at every level of it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and I think Judge Olmedo, uh, you know, has to has to recognize that a bit herself. Um, you know, some notwithstanding her her strengths as a judge, just it was such unchartered territory on this that, I, you know, the the expert witness, Claire Heathley being allowed as the expert witness and some of the decisions that she made while definitely appearing legally sound they're so unprecedented that they might be explored at the appellate level and well no I mean, question yeah. yeah yeah so many people are always confident on appeal and i think it it's it's foolish to be too confident but just given all the church of scientology's resources and everything i mean the fact that they took the uh, jane doe three's lawsuit uh, they actually petitioned the u.s supreme court to try to uh, hold that she couldn't sue, that she was bind, uh, bound by the church's arbitration agreement. Of course, the uh, Supreme Court rejected it and didn't review it. But just the fact that they hired a, a big law firm to do that and petitioned it, it just shows the resources that they have. Oh, they'll throw yeah. so much at the appeal. I mean, and they do have material to work with. I'm not saying that the verdict is uh, 
you know, vulnerable in any way, but they, they're going to go into court and say, Judge Omedo messed up. She allowed, she violated Danny's religious rights by allowing all this stuff about Scientology. She allowed all this reference to drugging when he wasn't even charged with drugging. I mean, they have a lot to work with, but you, you have seen a lot more of these than I have. Uh, I'm hearing that uh, despite Judge Omedo making some pretty bold rulings that the appellate court may be reluctant to overturn a rape conviction like that. Well, what is your feeling on that? Yeah, yeah, and that's the that's the thing. Especially a, a jury conviction like that is is traditionally very hard to uh, overturn. And not immediately knowing all the legal details, I, I can't speak specifically. But there's always the harmless error that that. Uh, stands. And it's even if something they bring up is found to be legally invalid, maybe Judge Almedo allowed something that shouldn't have been allowed in. If it's subject to the harmless error standard, the justices then have to say, okay, would the outcome of the case been any different if this hadn't happened? And a lot of the times the answer is no. So, and, and also we'll see rulings that appear to be unfavorable to the judge and it's he's being remanded for resentencing, but he ends up getting the same sentence and it's just a legal procedure that happens. So how much of an effect the appeal is actually going to have on whether he gets in and out of prison or not will be interesting. Well, we'll definitely be watching that. But in the meantime, you and I had a little bit of a scoop this morning. Yes. Uh, you and I got our hands on the, I mean, we knew this was coming that, uh, in a case like this, Danny Masterson's defense would have his friends and family write letters to the court asking for leniency. Of course, they, they really couldn't ask for much. It's, you know, they were, it was basically 15 to life or 30 to life. But yes. uh, we those letters were in the court file and would be made available at some point. You and I got our hands on them. You and I both published them about the same moment this morning. And I'm seeing some really shocked people to, to, to see that uh, Ashton Kutcher, Mila Kunis, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Billy Baldwin, uh, that these people all wrote letters. What what was your initial thought when you first went through them and saw who had written the letters? You know, I, I was surpri surprised at how uh, how many that 70s shows actors were there just because we haven't really heard public comments from this before this, have they? I mean, I've, I've heard and known that Danny was friends with them for a really long time, but just the lack of public comments, him not being on that 90s show. I mean, it was kind of a question of what was going on, but then just given the, the posture of the Masterson family, the defense of the case, and then the, the, the facts of the case, it seems like something that if you're friends with somebody for so long and it's something that happened 20 years ago, he knew the women, none of these people ever actually went in trial. And I mean, none of them were ever in court for any of the testimony. So you have to wonder how much they really know about it. It seems like it's easy for them to, to justify, you know, and just say that they want to support their friend. But then also from, from another standpoint, it's, it's a character reference letter and they seem genuine, you know, that they've known Danny for a long time. And that I'd like to think that, you know, everybody has friends that would stand by them. So, but it's, it's just the classic um, debate that you have because he was convicted of this and these are serious crimes and he's going to prison. And I think society really looks at this, badly as they should and then so people who are supporting him and saying he's a great guy he's a role model it just doesn't mesh with people's perception of him so it's it's it's, it's hard but then uh, you know to advocate that that uh no you know nobody should have you know nobody should have friends supporting them and the fact that he has lifelong friends who wrote letters for him it's like well, um, you know, they needed to stick up for him and they maybe they see problems in the case. But I think another thing to bring up is just the fact that they didn't see any of the trial. But that's true. They weren't there. Um, the other thing that struck me right away when I saw what uh, uh, Ash. And then me, 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 me. yeah, I'm I, I'm here. Uh, Sorry, I think uh, I might have cut out a little bit.
Yeah, let me uh maybe I can sign back on.
Oh, am I live right now? All right, we're, I'm waiting for Tony. I might have to. Uh, I want him to. I want him to lead the show. I don't I just want this to be my my rambling thing. So I might uh, get off camera here.
I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. Just a quick break. It's fine. It's fine. Just wanted to see. We'll, we'll edit that out when we get the video later. It was like how some people do that countdown on their YouTube. That was our countdown to the letters. All right. We were just getting into the good stuff. The letters. Yes. Uh, so from that 70s show, we saw um, Ashton Kutcher. We saw Mila Kunis. We saw the parents, Deborah Jo Rupp. Yeah. And uh, yeah. first would, um, I always forget his name. Uh, anyway, you know the dad. Yeah, I had to look that up, actually. That was that 70s show was on in an era in my life where I was not really watching network television. So I after I published the story, I was like, oh, I should have mentioned in there that they were his TV parents. But, yeah. Uh, but and, and I didn't publish everyone. Let me just real quick point out the yeah. letters from mom, Carol, dad, Peter and brother Christopher are kind of cut off and I didn't want to just like reproduce part of it. So they're in there, but I didn't reproduce it on my page. Uh, maybe we'll get a cleaner copy later, but given that, and there all, there's also a reference to an Ethan Supply letter that I didn't actually see unless it's that handwritten one that's illegible. But yes. uh, what I'll tell you though, what I did not see in there were letters from Wilder, um I'm going to say his name wrong. Valderrama, Topher Grace, and Laura Prepon. Oh, yeah. And those are the other, uh, uh, that 70s show stars right. too, too. And is it known, did he have like a really close relationship with them? Or, because I mean, it's it's understandable that a lot of people, I mean, I, you know, who knows when the, when the last time everyone has talked to him. I think you know, Laura was super tight with Danny and Bijou. And I think that, you know, he got her into Scientology. So I think it's interesting that Laura may have thought to herself, eh, I should probably not be associated with this case, which is totally yes. understandable. But then it makes you think about the others. Didn't they yeah. I mean, way? yeah. And it, it's such a, it's such a reputational risk, especially when you work in the inter entertainment industry, like they work in. And then also as somebody who sees this stuff, I just, how much good did those letters really do? I mean, it's not like Judge Almito is going to be like, oh, oh, Ashton Kutcher, I love him. Okay, probation, you know? It just seems like they're putting their reputation and their names out there, you know, not to do a lot of good at sentencing, but also it, it, it's probably just a sign of loyalty to Danny. And it, it just shows how, how much they believe in him and how good of friends they are with him. And it just kind of, the, kind of the unique issues in the case with just... Um, you know, the defense that he's put on over the years and the defense that Judge Almito addressed in her own comments, you know, it just seems like seems like he has a, a lot of friends who are on his side. And I just want to point out that uh, while Laura Prepon got into Scientology because of, uh, you know, Danny, actually, I think it was a close friend of Danny's, but whatever. Um, she announced some time ago that she's out of Scientology and she said she'd been out for five years. So that's yeah. something also to keep in mind if you're wondering why she did or did not write a letter. She did not, apparently. Interesting. Interesting. And that's one thing that's interesting for me, and, and I'm looking forward to your reporting on, is just the effects of this within the Church of Scientology. Because somebody was asking me another uh, news interview, you know, how the Church of Scientology is doing. It's like, well, just based on this Twitter account that sends hate tweets to people, not very good. But they also just seem... I mean, it's it's funny to look at their legal resources and look at that Twitter account because I'm like, OK, this must be some kind of like fringe thing within Scientology that they're not putting a lot of resources into because the the hate Scientology account is not anything to be taken seriously. But the, you know, rip petition that they filed to the Supreme Court by Winston Strawn LLP was definitely something to be taken seriously. Even they have a lot of money for attorneys. Yeah. They have a lot of money for private investigators. But especially if you check out like Mike Rinder's blog, Mike's really great at keeping an eye on things like OT committees and turnouts of events. And, you know, if you just look at his blog over the years, it's just absolutely clear. Scientology is dwindling. It's just not the force that it once was. It's hurting. So this is a really bad timing for David Miscavige. Yeah. That all this is going down. But they're going to keep doing what they do. They're going to keep smearing people with their, like you said, their attack social media stuff. But, you know, it, it points out there's no letter from David Miscavige in the mm -hmm. list that I saw. There's no letter um, from, you know, Corinne Powell. 
But there are letters from Scientologists. There's the whole Rubisi clan. Basically, everyone wrote a letter there. And uh, there are other Scientologists who wrote. But, um, yeah, it's not good timing for Scientology. Scientology is having, really coming out of the p- pandemic in a weakened position. And, again, I want to give credit to Jane Doe 1 in her statement. She kept bringing it back to Scientology and how much Scientology was involved in this case, perpetuated things, vi- re-victimized the victims, tried to keep them from going to the LAPD yeah. and protected Danny Masterson. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was a big theme. I mean, we heard that in the first trial, but definitely the second trial, there was such a, a heavier focus on that. And yeah, the comments about the church of Scientology, I think really resonated in the courtroom, but then also on both sides, because it's such a mix of people that uh, supporters and, and non-supporters of Masterson that I think some people hear the Scientology talk and just kind of think, you know, here we go again. But it, for the prosecutors, it was such an important part of explaining the, the, the 20 year gap, but to even call it a, a, a gap is not accurate because there was so much going on in, in all those years that was so relevant to it. But uh, the, you know, stalking and harassment claims. And then I, I, I've, I've heard from different camps that that as an appellate issue is, is one thing that they're, that they're hoping can get some traction is uh, Judge Almedo's allowance of the victims to talk about the stalking and harassment or, or that they felt uh, threatened by the Church of Scientology for reporting this, but the emphasis to the jury that this is not for the truth of the matter, but to establish state of mind. Because I think that was a, a, a big part of it. But again, it's just a, a question of whether it actually leads to the convictions overturned. And this is a years long process. Too. If you remember, though, keep in mind, uh, she was pretty good about keeping the allegations from the, the civil lawsuit separate and out. But then, if you remember when uh, Sean Hawley was cross-examining Jane Doe 3, they put an email up on the overhead for her to look at. And I, I couldn't quite make it out from the lap, back row of the courtroom. But Jane Doe 3 looked at that email and she said, there's a problem here. I remember the, the room was like, what? And she said, I... I, th- I recognize some of this email, but I didn't write most of it. And it was like, whoa, what's that about? Yeah. And it was basically an allegation of hacking that this email was altered. And that never was, they never got to the bottom of that. They didn't have time. But Judge Olmedo then ruled that by putting a possibly hacked email up as evidence in the court, the defense had opened the door to them to talk up for them to talk about hacking allegations. And she said, just not, not any kind of harassment, but hacking. And so, yeah, I'm sure the defense is going to cry and whine that allegations of harassment and stalking and surveillance got into the case, but I'm sure the, you know, whoever's, you know, defending the judge will say, look, the defense opened the door. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have the attorney general's office or the, the district attorney's office defending the, the conviction. And, and, and yeah, there's so many aspects with what the defense did to allow this. And, and then some of their own conjectures and, and mentioning of, of Scientology, I think will be, will be interesting to see how that plays out for sure. But um, w- one thing regarding the, 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 the future of it. I mean, re- like you're saying that this is a really bad timing for it. And I really can't think of worse publicity for it because as, as common as it is and as well known as it is because of its association with Hollywood, I think so many people are still just like, what even is the church of Scientology? If they're just kind of at casual glance. So I think for a lot of people, this has got to be their only association with Scientology is the Danny Masterson case. And that's just, that's just not good because I mean, you've mentioned the uh, you know, the, the, the flamey or the, the internet activity that goes on, but I'm like, their, their social media accounts, the way they kind of try to be a voice of criticism for these people. It just doesn't seem like it's anything to be taken seriously. No, it's not, especially it's, the way they so, do it. It's so outrageous. Yeah. 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 And, and, and there's an, a, a guy in uh, Los Angeles, he has the, the Twitter account, uh, film the police LA. He was uh 
in LA filming the police. And he was right in front of the Scientology headquarters on Hollywood. And he has a whole explanation about why he needed to be standing right there because it was the only angle that he could get the whole encounter at. But of course, the Scientology guards uh, said something to him. So now he makes a point and you can tell he really enjoys it. He Every time he's around the Scientology headquarters, he films them and just starts yelling about how they're a cult. And when the people are trying to talk to new members, uh, film the police LA is like, don't do it. It's a cult. It's a cult. It's uh, I mean, those people are way more effective in their PR and kind of social media stunts against Scientology. So to think that Scientology is going to be able to counter, you know, things like that. And then the Danny Masterson verdict is just, I'm not sure. Well, another thing I want to point out about the letters was that um, as you're reading them from Ashton and Mila and Billy Baldwin and Giovanni Rabisi, but especially like the, the producers and writers, what are they all saying? They're all saying, the thing they remember about Danny was how anti-drug he was. And he would yeah. just go to the other crew, go to the cast and say, look, I want you to take a pledge. We're not going to engage in drugs. And what they're not saying, of course, is that that's what he was doing as a Scientologist, that that's right. the influence of Scientology. And then, of course, the other thing that makes it ironic is he's literally convicted of drugging and raping women. Yes, yes, because that is, I mean, that, and, and that's another big difference between the first and second trial is the more emphasis on the drugging that happened. And the, the uh, two women he was convicted of raping pretty unequivocally testified to, to that. And Jane Doe 3, the uh, actual charged rape, I think, am, am I right that it did not involve that? But there was another encounter she testified about involving a restaurant that, that, especially in the second trial in her testimony, it was implied that there could have been something involved with the drink there. But like, yeah, I think the, the drugging of, of, of drinks was a huge theme through the second trial. Particularly. But he's so, anti-drug. He's, um, he's helping keeping kids off of drugs, you know, some, some irony there. Yeah. But uh, you're right. I mean, it, 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 it is a question of whether these letters are effective. I don't even know how effective they are in general, but they clearly weren't in this case. Um, I think it was, you know, the, the severity of the crime and, and, you know, what Judge Almeida has said about it that just overwhelmed any considerations about what a great guy Danny was with the, you know, knowing every janitor's name at the ranch. Yeah. You know, I, I've got to say, as, as, as somebody who's a, a little new to the, the details here, so is it true that the, the guy who played Stephen Hyde on that 70s show doesn't even smoke pot? I mean, is, is Danny is one of those guys who is just he's never even smoked marijuana before or... Do we know? I mean, I don't know about that side of his drugs. I know he's a heavy drinker, and uh, those first few weeks in jail must have been pretty tough for him. But uh, I'm not sure why people think that he's going to still be going through withdrawals three months later. I don't think that works that way. But yeah. anyway, he he's – look, he's 47. Apparently, he's a little thin, but I, I don't – I, I, I assume, you know, when they go to a state facility, they I don't know. I don't know what kind of a place he's going to go to. I'm, not, I'm actually not all that interested, to tell you the truth. Uh, I'm more interested in what the appeals are going to say, what they're going to say about Judge Olmedo. Yeah. Um, and whether any of that's going to have any traction. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting that Mesereau and Applebaum withdrew their appeals because, I mean, I, I think I, I'm not sure if the, the legal reasoning was anything to to overturn. But Omino's ruling on that sanction did seem to me to have a lot of stuff in there that she didn't need to include. And she did kind of make it clear that she was pissed off that at Scientology for like complaining about her to the DA's office. But it was extraneous from her legal reasoning for actually sanctioning them. So maybe they just realized that. And if it was, you know, I got the, def I, yeah, that was about June 7th was that hearing. And I got that definite sense, Megan, I got the same sense you did that the law may not strictly be on the judge's side here, but she and the DAs are clearly so outraged that Mesro and Applebaum leaked this information to Scientology that it's just wrong. Maybe she's having yeah. a hard time pointing out the statute that spells it out, but that to their, her it was wrong. And so I did have that feeling, Megan. I had the same feeling that, you know what, I think Mesro and Applebaum probably have some pretty good appealable stuff here. And I mean, you know, they, they probably will have, but then they dropped it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, cause they already have the, the publicity from it. I wonder if it's anything like that, but you know, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe it's not done yet. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll see something else come of it because I think, like you said, it really seemed like they were the, the Masterson camp is really banking on the appeal. This other uh, trial that I just covered involving the, the rapper Tory Lanez who shot Megan the stallion. He had all sorts of post conviction stuff where a really elaborate motion for new trial. And it was this huge long process. And I always just kind of got the impression that, I mean, his lawyers were the only ones benefiting there. They were charging him huge amounts of money for stuff that really had no legal chance of passing. And it seems like that's something we didn't see in the Masterson camp is he had better counsel, at least on his side for that. Well, speaking of uh, the Masterson side, I, I uh, understand you got into it a little bit with, um, was it Philip Cohen's PR person, Holly? Did something oh, happen oh yeah you, you know it wasn't it wasn't really anything it was just it was uh, i was sitting next to her when leah uh ramini said something to her and they kind of had like a back and forth or something and i and i tweeted about it and i don't know i no, nobody no nobody likes to you know have their laundry aired like that but you know it it, it, it was fine i just got to do what i do and because i have to say uh on the mass side the the few people that would say hi to me and were friendly Holly was one of them. I I, oh, yes. I was yeah. I was very always happy to see her in the courtroom. She's the PR person for Philip Cohen, and Sean Holly. Sean Holly was always very polite to me and said hi, and that was cool. Philip. Yeah, Cohen, all of, all of them have been really great. I th I think it was just an example of the emotions in the courtroom and having all those people in like a tight space like that. But yeah, no, Holly has always been been great, and you know she works for a lot of different people too. So I think it was just an, an example of you know and and just how passionately they feel on both sides of it. I mean, Holly working with Sean Holly, who's a, a great attorney and, and well respected, and and Phil Cohen. Why you know we've talked about how uh, uh, Charlene Omedo had some pretty obvious disdain for him and his approaches. You know, he's an experienced attorney, and just what he does, getting up there and talking before a jury and questioning witnesses, it's it's not easy. And there's uh, there's not a lot of other attorneys out there who would be able to do a good job like that. Leah Remini was in the court, I understand, with a couple of the Jane Doe's. Can you tell us anything else about her being in the courtroom, maybe when the verdict was read or anything like that? I mean, not the verdict, the uh, sentence. It was. She uh, was with the victims and was seated uh, kind of over on the, the other corner of the courtroom on the other side of the lectern. So, you know, it was so packed and it's so mixed in there that they were farther enough away from me that I didn't really feel their their vibe. You know, I was closer to the Masterson family vibe, but they were definitely huddled together and and just showing support for each other. But, you know, Leah, Leah said something to Holly as she walked out. I mean, she really kind of started it with her by she walked out of the courtroom and said something right, right to her. I mean, I've seen, you know, clips of her and I, I know her from her, remember her from her Saved by the Bell appearance. But, uh, you know, she's, she has that personality where she's not going to back down at all. And I think Holly has the same personality, but Leah definitely started it when she walked out of the, the courtroom for, for sure. So yeah, Leah was not intimidated by any of it and was definitely there to, to show support for the victims. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry I missed it, but I'm sure glad you were there and yeah. some other folks that were keeping an eye out for us. Um, uh, how long did the whole thing last? It's probably about three hours. It's, it started at 830 and we were in the courtroom by like 835. But of course, you know how L.A. Superior Court works with their huge herd of bailiffs bossing everybody around and trying to position people. It takes like 15 or 20 minutes to get everybody into the courtroom. So we probably were started by, you know, 845 or so nine. And then it went until what, 1130, 1145 ish. There was a 15 minute break or so in the middle of it but it it was speeding along pretty well and and you know for me especially just covering the the rappers uh sentencing for the shooting it was so unusual this felt like a normal a, a regular sentencing and how a sentencing should be and that the focus was on the victims you know D danny masterson's lawyers weren't allowed to bring up character witnesses to talk about him or anything. He did have a chance to give an allocution to say something to judge Olmito, which he declined to do, which I mm. think is probably not surprising to people who've been covering the case, but uh, he, he, he had a chance to say something and he didn't say anything. So it really was the, the victim's moment yesterday. And uh, you, I remember you were very hard on the prosecution team in the first trial. Yeah. <laughs> 
um, what we, you know, you and I would have lunch all the time and talk about it. Uh, th now, after this, after the sentencing yesterday, they went out and held a press conference. How, how can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on the prosecutors this time and, and maybe what went down at that press conference? Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I'm, I'm reminded of, and I do have to remind myself is, you know, I don't know everything and that there is a lot more to prosecuting a case than just, you know, this one witness exam that I, that I saw. And there's such a, a process that goes into pretrial stuff and just getting the case ready for court, getting the charges ready, getting the victims, assembling the witnesses and putting it all together that I think it's a testament to them that they were able to do all that with su the support of the victims the entire time. Um, one of the Jane Doe's actually mentioned that she was talking about the effects of of the rape on her trust in people and her ability to trust men. And she said that she'd even had a, a, a run in or, or a, a questioning whether she could trust Reinhold Mueller and that she feels terrible about it because she said that he's, you know, probably the most honorable man that she's man that she's ever encountered. So to have the prosecutors have the victim saying something like that, I think is a real testament to what happened other than the, you know, and, and much more so than, you know, the one afternoon that I was in, in there and didn't think that his questioning of the witness was quite as Perry Mason like as I'd liked, you know, but <laughs> He, well, he, he did because Ariel had a great had a great closing because so much of being oh. an attorney in, in, in trial attorney is just theater. And are you a good public speaker? And I think um, Ariel kind of kind of takes the the cake on that. But Reinhold did a great job, especially at the press conference and just his compassion and understanding for the victims. You know, yeah, I, I thought that uh, they must. I, what I'm curious about is that inter trial period, because something they came up with some ideas that really worked the second time. And I'm curious about how that conversation went and giving Ariel more of a role in the second trial. And um, boy, it really seemed to pay off, but I understood why you were critical of them in the first trial. I mean, I remember during that first trial thinking, I don't know, these witnesses are pretty compelling, but you kept saying, no, they're not doing a good job. And then when, when the hung jury came in, I knew you were right that they had just not put together a strong enough narrative. And boy, they did the second time, and really it was embodied in Arielle Anson's closing where she really told a story about that. that and, and, and also what Reinhold also added as far as that all of these things that Danny was accused of, he had to have planned meticulously. Yeah, and, yeah. And he had multiple times to change his mind, and he did not. Yeah, exactly. The the multiple instances and the fact that he did this one time and then he he did it again. This was, you know, premeditated and he knew what was what he was doing. And it was really an argument for why this whole idea that the uh, sentences should be served concurrently and he'd only he'd be eligible for parole after 15 years. Reinald was just saying that's not that's not a just sentence at all. And he has to pay for each crime through through the maximum sentence, through the sentence allowed. Wow. Yeah. And the press conference, how did, how did I, you know, I, I didn't get a sense of that. What was that like? Yeah. You know, it was, it was one of those things where y'all just rush out there and everybody's, there's just so much commotion and so many people everywhere. So Sean Hawley did come out first and I somehow missed that, but it was so brief. She read aloud the statement that uh, she had, that's out everywhere about the, about the appeal and the best uh, appellate attorneys and then left. And then uh, Reinhold came out a few minutes later with Ariel and there was a big crowd for him and a lot of questions for it. And, you know, he seemed to seem to be, I don't want to say relishing it because that's not an appropriate term for such an, a, a serious case. But I mean, prosecutors are proud of themselves after they, they get something like this. And it's such a long process for them that this was, you know, a big, a big moment in the, in the sun for them. And just to kind of show the leadership on the case and to be able to, to speak on it like that. Well, you were saying that maybe some people in the public still don't know much about Scientology, but you know, what about you? How, how coming into the first trial, how much did you know about Scientology? And do you feel like that the two trials, uh, you know, you know a lot more about it now? Yeah, I mean, I went into the first trial really knowing absolutely nothing about it. And now I feel like I still really know absolutely nothing about it. But but I but not really. I know so much so many more people and so much more about it. There's still so many mysterious 
things about it to me, but I now feel completely educated on it. And I also feel like I know how to find out things about it. I mean, I found out your reporting through that and then just the history of everything that's gone on. And then also the lawsuits. I mean, that's what people, people have asked me about the closure that this brings the victims. And while I think there's definitely closure here and it's, it's really important. I mean, the fact that the civil cases are now starting up and going to get pretty heated. I don't think there's really much closure that's going to happen to the overall issue, but I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to covering that. And it just makes me more curious about, about Scientology. It makes me kind of want to go up to the celebrity center and go in there and take a, take a personality <laughs> test and see what happens. Because I, I mean, I, I, I am willing to believe that it is a little bit of this stuff overblown. I mean, some of the stalking and harassment, because as, as somebody who just was harassed online for months and months and months by all these Tory Lanez people. I mean, I'm wondering, you know, is the, is the harassment beyond that? And I'm, and I'm, I understand that it is. I've heard the stuff about the dog being poisoned and Leah has allegations of credit card fraud in her new lawsuit. So I'm, I'm curious about the, the depths of the, in, in details of that and, and how it actually plays out. Well, that's, that's what's going to be interesting in the next year or two is that um, these allegations have been made, but now we get to see some evidence. And I know there's some really interesting evidence, and it's going to, I think, going to be really interesting to see that come out. The other thing I want people to know <clears throat> is that not only were you shuttling back and forth between the Harvey Weinstein trial and the Danny Maston trial, keeping up on both, writing about both, and you were doing the same thing during the second trial with some other cases going on, but unlike the rest of us, you were also running outside as fast as you could so you could get into place to get pictures of these people coming yeah. in and going out. Yeah. And I was always amazed how often your pictures were better than the professionals who were, you know, it's their job to get these people. And, you know, I've been asked this before. How did Megan convince Danny and Bijou to stop, pose, and smile outside the courthouse nobody else got that how'd you do that yeah and and you know i guess it was it was chris their their friend chris the tall guy who was always in court and was at sentencing yesterday and th and that's one thing that struck me about them was just how normal they seem and as you know somebody who's around their age they just seem like the kind of people that you would see out at an event or something and, and want to, you know, want to hang out or, or chat. But when I was, uh, I, I was following them out to get a, a photo of them just because I kind of have no qualms about that now, but Chris actually suggested, he said, Hey, if you want to get a photo with them uh, of them, you know, maybe why don't you just ask them? And he, he was being nice about it. And I just said, well, all right. And I remember Danny and, and Bijou, they kind of looked at each other and conversed and we're like, yeah, sure. And turned around and, and posed for the photo. And I mean, it was just such a, a, a weird moment, but I, I remember there was, there was part of, of them that seemed a little taken aback by like how impersonal the, the press was. And I remember um, thinking that, you know, some of the press people were like, oh, well, they never talk or they never say anything. And it's like, well, it's not their job to come up to us and start asking us questions, you know? So th there was always just kind of this standoffish thing that I felt like you could kind of break through just by just be saying, Hey, can, can we get a photo, you know? So, right. yeah. Can you believe I just take those photos with my iPhone too? I'm just able to. And they're to, so good. Yeah. Well, that was Chris Wadhams. Yeah. He is, um, their very good friend and he is the donor of Bijou's kidney. Yeah. So super, super tight with that family. And he's all also always the tallest guy in the courtroom. Yes. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. And just the genuine friendship that they seem to have and the support for each other, because I mean, it just goes to the complexity of the case and, and really what the victims talked about and just how how charming Danny is. The idea that he's just, you know, an overt predator, although Jane Doe three did talk about how her intuition and she wishes she had trusted her intuition after an encounter where she hid in her friend's apartment for a couple of hours. And I guess he waited outside and her friends convinced her that he was so charming and look how romantic he's being. And she wishes she had trust her intuition and not, and not gone with them. But um, yeah. Yeah. He is not Luke Watson. I saw some people asking, is that Luke Watson? I never saw Luke Watson in court. Uh, he did not apparently submit a letter, but of course people ask about him because he's all over this story. I mean, he's constantly showing up in the testimony of the three victims uh, as somebody that was helping Danny out. And um, 
Yeah, it's there are tentacles of this that they couldn't go down in a criminal case because they got to stay very focused. Um, but there are tentacles that I'd like to see uh, government agency explore. You know, one thing that I reported that uh, it still blows my mind is that at that time that they forced Jane Doe one into signing that agreement and taking the money, like the, that day, Danny gave two million dollar buildings to his assistant. Oh, wow. Just signed them over. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, a year or so later, once it had passed the period for when Jane Doe one could file a lawsuit, she just signed them back over. Oh, so, interesting. And that's all in the record. Those records exist. I published them. And so that's the kind of thing that, okay, he's been convicted of, you know, these forcible rapes. But there was some other stuff going on, too. And I, it would be nice to see a government agency get into that. But I don't know if they can. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that's one thing we're going to see with the civil process is just how much different it is from from the criminal process. And, you know, how how the lawsuits were actually play out and how the discovery process goes and what kind of defense the Church of Scientology brings to it, because it could be it could be a, a much a much different process than what I mean, it will be a much different process than Danny's criminal case. But you just wonder, you know, what's the substance of these allegations when they come out, what, what is the effect going to be on the church and, and what more are we going to learn here? Well, Megan, you did a terrific job. Wish I'd been there uh, yesterday. And um, I don't know. It's, it, it does have a feeling of closure, but like you said, we've got a lot of other things to look into. These appeals will probably come pretty soon. I don't, I don't have a timeline for people uh, handy, but I, I, I know they're working on them right now. We need to find out where they're sending Danny. We need to find out when the appeals uh, documents are going to come in. And uh, we'll be covering this for a long time. Um, yes. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's I, I, I look forward to running into you again down at uh, the courthouse one of these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one thing I do think we're going to see the notice of appeal filed very soon. There's a pretty quick deadline on that. But that's basically just a forum. But the opening brief is going to be the real substantive thing. And I bet that's not filed until the beginning of the year, because it's kind of one of those things, even if they could file it right away, it's such a long system for the appellate court that why why rush it kind of thing. But when it does come up for oral argument, I think we'll be able to watch that Ooh, online. So right. oh, and then another thing, when uh, Danny gets to state prison, and it's almost like, don't say this, because I don't want to give anyone ideas, but his mugshot's going to be public record we'll be able to request it and get a copy of it so a few All things right. but thank you for yeah that thank tip. you so much it was, it was great to meet you and hopefully uh hopefully you'll come out here again soon i mean there's a lot of i will i will back. be coming out and hopefully we'll run into each other at court again and in the meantime uh folks listen ch go check out those letters they're at my Substack. they're at megan Substack, and sign up to get our uh, updates because we, you know, we're going to keep reporting every day yes thanks all, all right thank you very much